Hello, I'm Don Markholtz, and you're listening to Looking Up with Don. This is the Looking Up with Don podcast, episode number 111, for the week of February 16th, 2022. The related website for this podcast is donmarkholtz.com. That is spelled D-O-N-M-A-C-H-H-O-L-Z dot com. Two H's. What's up in the sky this week? As our week begins on Wednesday, February 16th, the moon will be full. Official full moon is at 1656 Universal Time. The moon will be in the constellation Leo, rising when the sun sets and setting when the sun rises. By next Tuesday, February 22nd, the moon will be in the morning sky, not yet third quarter, but about 70% full. It will be rising after midnight, giving us a few hours of dark sky observation. The moon will be in the constellation Libra, heading south. For those astral imagers out there, the moon plays a less significant role. I have seen many good astrophoto images taken with a bright moon in the sky. Us visual observers are more sensitive to the bright light of the moon and twilight and light pollution. In the evening sky, we have Neptune in the west and Uranus high in the sky. And a few comets. The winter Milky Way runs overhead more or less from north to south. This is where you find all of those star clusters and nebula. In the morning sky, we still have our gathering of planets in the east, starting with the very bright planet Venus and Mars, and Mercury. Well, we even have the dwarf planet Pluto in on that mix. On the 16th, Mercury reaches its greatest elongation west of the sun, meaning it is well-placed for viewing in the morning sky. I've been able to see it for the past week. Will you be able to see the International Space Station this week? which for our purposes begins Wednesday, February 16th through Tuesday, February 22nd. It depends upon where you are located. This week, we have seven zones. All you need to know is your latitude. Two zones will not see the International Space Station at all this week. That is north of 60 degrees north and a slice of the southern hemisphere between 30 and 5 degrees south. From 45 to 60 degrees north, the ISS will be in your morning sky, but only for the second part of the week. That's you, England. Between 30 and 45 degrees north, and that is for many of you, the ISS will be in your morning sky for the whole week. Between 5 degrees south and 30 degrees north, which covers the equator, the ISS will be in your morning sky for only the first part of the week. Between 30 and 40 degrees south, the ISS will be in your evening sky for only the first part of the week. And south of 40 degrees south, the ISS will be in your evening sky for the whole week. To determine where you can see it, go to the website heavens-above.com, enter your location, then click on ISS. As dark skies return to our evenings, a few comets are easily observable. The brightest is periodic comet 19P Borley at magnitude 9. A small telescope should show this one. It is south of the constellation Aries, and it's near the planet Uranus in the sky. Comet C-2021A1 Leonard 
is now magnitude 10 and is visible best from the southern hemisphere. Wow, magnitude 10 already. How fast it has changed. Periodic Comet 104P Coel is magnitude 10 to 11 and in the constellation Taurus. A long period comet C2019L3 Atlas is holding steady at magnitude 10 and it's in the constellation Gemini. Periodic Comet 67P Churyumov Gedesimenko is fading. It's now at magnitude 11, and it's in the constellation Cancer. All of these comets are plotted in Podcast 111, Map 1, which you can get from my website. To get the most accurate and up-to-date positions for these comets, go to the website heavens-above.com and click on Comets. There you will find the positions and maps for each comet. As you know, as a visual comet hunter, I keep track of all the comets visually discovered. This consists of an Excel spreadsheet, actually two, one for each comet and one for each individual who found these a comet. And it does tell me where the comets are found and how bright they are at discovery and who is finding them. Since I began systematic searches on January 1st, 1975, 94 comets have been visually discovered. Some of those 94 comets had two or even three discoverers. So a total of 122 times an individual discovered a comet in which they got their name attached to it. And some individuals found more than one comet So 60 different individuals visually discovered comets during those past 47 years. I remember reading up on comet hunting in 1974 as I was preparing to undertake this hobby. Again and again, it was said that most comets are found by amateurs who were intentionally searching for them. And it is a rare case where someone will find a comet accidentally. That is, while they were not searching for one. Well, now I have a body of data covering nearly a half century, and it is current data. So of the 94 comets, how many do you think were found accidentally? Take a guess. Well, the answer is nine. The remaining comets, 85 of them, were found by amateurs intentionally searching, and the average time for each discovery is about 390 hours, but the range is from one hour through 3,024 hours. This week, we look at those nine accidental discoveries. The first one, in early July 1975, Doug Berger and Dennis Milan discovered a comet while looking at M2. Doug Berger was at a star party at Henry Cole State Park in central California, southeast of San Jose, and he saw a fuzzy object, magnitude 7.6, near the globular cluster M2, which he was observing. This was on the evening of July 4th. Doug Berger is better known for inventing Astronomy Day, which is now held each spring and fall. The comet had been discovered on July 2nd by Toru Kobayashi of Japan, and he was comet hunting. Word of the comet discovery had not yet gotten out when Berger and Malone saw it. Then on July 6, Dennis Milan, an ALPO, that is Association of Lunar and Planetary Observer Comet Recorder, picked up the comet while he was observing M2 from Mount Washburn in Yellowstone National Park. 
both Berger and Milan reported the comet to the Central Bureau of Astronomical Telegrams, known as a CBAT, and received credit for the discovery. It is known as Comet Kobayashi Berger Milan. According to Dr. Brian Marsden of the CBAT, there were as many as 550 independent discoveries of this comet, including one before Berger saw it and at least three more before Milan found it. But only these two individuals reported it properly and they got credit for the comet. At the star party with Doug Berger that night was a gentleman named Jerry Ratley. Jerry, who passed away about four years ago, was a very knowledgeable deep sky observer. He and I did a couple of Messe marathons together from Loma Prieta in the Santa Cruz Mountains in the late 1970s and early 1980s. We also discussed galaxies, clusters, and nebula well beyond the Messier list. Very faint stuff. An exchange list of objects we had observed. He was helpful in my compilation of the massive marathon list of over 500 objects. Then Jerry moved to Arizona. In 1985, he was the first person to observe all 110 Messe objects in one night. In fact, I now have in my shop the very telescope that he used to do that. He never wrote for the large magazines or lectured at conventions, so you might not know who he was, but he knew his stuff and easily found his way around the sky. He was soft-spoken and had a good sense of humor. On that night with Doug Berger, Jerry realized that this fuzzy object near M2 was not supposed to be there and suggested to Doug that he reported as a new comet. It took some convincing, but Doug finally did, and he got credit for the discovery. Our next comet to be accidentally discovered was Comet Hale Bopp on the evening of July 22nd, 23rd, 1995. Both of those men were looking at the globular cluster M70. Alan Hale in New Mexico had, had hunted for comets through much of the 1980s, and he stopped hunting after about 400 hours. Alan is an excellent comet expert. He knows a lot, and he writes a lot about comets. He publishes articles uh, almost every week on comets, and uh, the series he's working on now is entitled Fire and Stone. It would be a good idea to look that up and read some of what he writes. He also observes comets. On this night, he was observing known comets, making notes and estimating magnitudes. And then he had some time before the next comet, comet periodic comet Clark, would rise. So he spent the time looking at objects in this area. Ellen Hale is very familiar with the procedure for reporting comets, so he reported this 11th magnitude object almost immediately. Thomas Bopp was at a star party in Arizona also looking at M70. He noticed the object nearby and was encouraged to contact the CBAT to report the object. He did, and the rest is history. This was on Saturday night, Sunday morning, July 22nd, 23rd. Two days later, I received a phone call from Jerry Ratley, asking me if there was a comet near M70. He was observing the cluster, and he saw the comet too, but two days late to get credit for it. The next three years had one accidental comet discovery each. All were from Australia. Actually, we have seven accidental discoveries in the next six years. On July 22nd, 1977, almost exactly two years after Comet Hale-Bopp, Justin Tilbrook of Australia 
discovered a comet while observing variable stars. The comet was magnitude 10.0, 72 degrees from the sun in the evening sky. He was using an 8-inch reflecting telescope. After this accidental discovery, Tilbrook started visual comet hunting and visually found another comet two years later. Peter Williams, also of Australia, found a comet on August 10th, 1998, while he was looking at variable stars. That comet was magnitude 8.4 and 103 degrees from the sun in the evening sky. Williams was using a 12-inch reflector telescope. And on April 16th, 1999, Steve Lee, also of Australia, picked up a comet while at a star party. He was looking for a planetary nebula called NGC 5189 because he was going to be showing it to others later. The comet was magnitude 9.3 and 122 degrees from the sun in the evening sky. It was an easy object in his 16-inch telescope. Next, Albert Jones of New Zealand was looking at variable stars on November 18, 2000, when he picked up a new bright comet at magnitude 7.1 in the morning sky. Amazingly, this is Jones's second accidental visual comet discovery. He found one in 1946 while also looking at variable stars. This comet, the 2001, had been found earlier in the day by Sayogo Usamayaha of Japan, who was searching for comets. So the comet bears both names. Next, on August 18, 2001, Vance Petru of Canada discovered a new comet while looking for M1. He was at a star party and was using a 20-inch reflector. It turns out that this comet, periodic comet Petview, returns every 5.5 years. The next year, March 11, 2002, Douglas Snyder of Arizona, also using a 20-inch reflector, picked up a new comet while looking at objects in the constellation Aquila. Now, he was a comet hunter, having done about 70 hours in the previous years, but Snyder was not searching for comets when he found this. This comet was also found by Shigigi Murakami of Japan hours earlier. He was searching for comets at the time, having accumulated 210 hours. Finally, Sebastian Honeck of Germany found a comet on July 22, 2002, while looking for globular star clusters with his 10-inch schmidt cassegrain telescope. So 11 individuals found nine comets accidentally. You have heard about each one. Do they have anything in common? They sure do. Seven of the nine comets were found south of the equator. We know that the southern sky was not covered as thoroughly as the northern sky. In fact, in one study, Cernus suggested that competition in the northern sky was 30 times greater than in the southern sky. So it would seem natural that undiscovered comets would be in the southern sky. It was not being swept as well as only William Bradfield and a couple of other comet hunters were based in the southern hemisphere. Four of the 11 discoverers lived south of the equator. Most of these comets were found at long elongations from the sun, which is not near the western sky in the evening, nor in the eastern sky in the morning. Now, most of us comet hunters sweep those areas, and not so much the areas far from the sun. 
That means that any undiscovered comets placed far from the sun as seen from the Earth would have a greatly, greater likelihood of being discovered by a non-comet hunter. Four of these comets were found by someone at a star party. It makes me wonder, how often did amateur astronomers at that time go out on their own to look at the sky compared to those who watch with others at a star party? And what's up with this? The high density of accidental discoveries at the turn of the century. We had a stretch between 1997 and 2002. With 13 comets visually found, seven, more than half of them, were found accidentally. I had not noticed that until now. This is an amazing high density. All I can suggest is that by the late 1990s, many of the old visual comet hunters had begun to drop out of the search. The automated, government-funded search surveys were cropping up, designed to find comets and asteroids that may one day hit us. These amateur astronomers knew that their chances of finding additional new comets had been diminished, and they moved on to other areas of astronomy. Some went from visual searches to photographic and CCD searches. Some went to observing known comets or obtaining accurate positions for known comets. Some left the hobby of astronomy completely. So what we had left was a small handful of visual comet hunters, and some comets got by us and became discoverable by those not looking for comets. And I think maybe one more factor, large reflectors. Dobsonian telescopes became affordable to many amateur astronomers, and they bought these scopes and started using them a lot, putting them in an ideal position to accidentally find comets. This was a sweet spot for such discoveries. After many visual comet hunters left the field, and before the government-funded sky surveys took over. And one more thing we find. July is a good time for accidental discoveries, with six of the 11 individuals finding them in July, two of them on July 22nd and two on July 23rd. Can you expect to accidentally visually find a new comet today? First, let's get this straight. Anyone can find a comet in any part of the sky at any time. It's been that way for a long, long time. Having said that, your chances are slim. Even those of us looking for comets for 200 hours per year or more may go years before finding a new comet, and we search the areas not covered by the surveys. Looking in the areas the survey searches is unlikely to find anything as they cover all objects to magnitude 20 or fainter. That's much fainter than what you can do visually. For our binocular challenge this week, let's look at a couple of open star clusters in our evening sky, M50 and M48. Both of these objects are identified on Podcast 111, Map 3. M50 is magnitude 6.4 and measures 8 by 6 arc minutes in size. After you find it in binoculars, try seeing it with the unaided eye. This cluster is not round. It has extensions and waves of stars going in all directions. The brightest star, which appears to be red, is in the southern end of the cluster. Our other object this week is M48. It's magnitude 6.2, and it's, it's much larger. It measures 40 by 35 arc minutes, bigger than the full moon as seen from the Earth. 
This was once a missing Messe object. He made a mistake in plotting it. Once again, it may be visible to the unaided eye. This cluster is much larger than M50, yet it seems to have fewer stars. With the bright moon out of the evening sky, we have some really nice telescopic challenges this week. Get out your best telescope, the one with the best optics, not necessarily the largest optics, and let's look at some double stars. They are bright ones identified on podcast 111, map 1. A double star is where one star goes around the other. The brighter star is called the primary one, and the fainter one is called the secondary one. The first star is in Orion and is called Rigel. This system is 860 light years away from us. It has multiple stars, but we're going only for the two brightest. Rigel A is the brightest one, and it is much larger than our sun and many times more luminous. It varies slightly in brightness, but hangs out at around magnitude zero. Its companion, Rigel B, is magnitude 6.7 which is 400 times fainter than the primary, and it's nine and a half arc seconds to the south. With a steady night, a medium to large telescope should be able to split this pair. I've done it several times. Crank up the magnification and see what you can see. Our next target is the brightest star in the sky, the nighttime sky, and that's the star Cirrus. This star system is only 8.3 light years away. The primary star is very bright, magnitude minus 1.46, while its companion, known as Cirrus B, also known as the Pup, is much fainter at magnitude 8.5. Now, this is a difference of 10 magnitudes. The pup is 10 arc seconds northeast of Cirrus, about as far away as it gets, and the same distance as the Rigel double we just looked at. Just that this one is northeast of Cirrus. It will remain this far away for the next decade. It takes 50 years to go around Cirrus once. If you had trouble splitting Rigel, well, Cirrus is even more difficult. So make sure your optics and eyepieces are clean, your telescope is culminated, and get a night when the atmosphere is steady. And be patient. Keep watching. The fainter star might appear and then disappear as the atmosphere flickers. And use very high magnification. If necessary, you can place an occulting bar across the star Cirrus. Now, this is an opaque object placed in front of the eyepiece at the focus of the eyepiece, and you use that to block out the star Cirrus. Then you should be able to pick up the fainter star, the pup. To recap the podcast, what's up this coming week? With the moon getting out of the evening sky, get out there and start observing. See some comets, two open clusters, and a couple of bright double stars. You have been listening to Looking Up with Don, podcast episode number 111 for February 16, 2020. I'm Don Mockeltz. Once again, the related website for this podcast is donmockholtz.com. That is spelled D-O-N-M-A-C-H-H-O-L-Z.com. Two H's. You can contact me at dontheastronomer at gmail.com. Once again, donthastronomer at gmail.com. 
God willing and pod willing. I'll be back next week for another episode of Looking Up with Don. I will get us started on preparing for next month's Messe Marathon. All that and more. Thank you for listening. See the sky this week. I'll see you next week.